thank you everyone for uh, taking your um, short breaks. And again, I can't say enough about the panels that we've already heard from today. Uh, as you all have been active and chiming in through the chat, there's lots for Pacha to consider uh, and actions that we possibly need to take. So much of the work is certainly done in subcommittee. And I just want to thank all of the panelists thus far. You've given us uh, quite a lot of food uh, for thought and have challenged us uh, to put some work in front of us going into 2024 uh, to respond to a lot of what we have heard uh, from you all. So just thank you. Thank you again. Uh, moving on, uh, we know that addressing uh, the needs of trans men and non-binary individuals is critical to ending the HIV epidemic because it involves dismantling barriers to healthcare access, providing inclusive education and support, and acknowledging the impact of stigma on mental health and recognizing these unique intersections of identities that contribute to vulnerabilities. Uh, with that said, I really am excited to turn over this next panel conversation to Pacha members Tori Cooper and Tiomi Luckett, both of whom have been uh, pioneers and real uh, fierce leaders and advocates uh, in this conversation. And so, Tiomi and Tori, I will turn it over to you all. Thank you so much, Fearless Leader. First, I want to start by saying welcome home, Arlene. All right, uh, we have certainly missed you, so welcome home. I also want to start off by reading a quote. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, and the quote is by Audre Lorde, and it says, you do not have to be me in order for us to fight alongside each other. I do not have to be you to recognize that our wars are the same. What we must do is commit ourselves to some future that can include each other and to work towards that future with the particular strengths of our individual identities. And in order for us to do this, we must allow each other our differences at the same time as we recognize our sameness. And that's again by Audre Lorde. So today, uh, Tiomi and I are going to kind of usher along a conversation. That's what facilitation is. It's ushering along a conversation with three gentlemen who are brilliant, bold, beautiful, brash, and absolutely committed um, to everything that they stand for. Um, today, transmasculine folks, uh, we, we're using terms like trans men and transmasculine folks and folks who are masculine of center. We're not going to use the word transgender throughout this conversation every single time. In some ways, it's a bit stigmatizing. And what it does is it kind of others folks. It others Tiomi and me, and it also, uh, in some ways, others the gentlemen. You all know what the subject is, and you know who the subject experts are that are going to be speaking. Um, we're going to have the gentlemen come on and introduce themselves um, after Tioni introduces herself and tell you a little bit about her. But first, I'll, well, go ahead, Tioni, tell the folks who you are and um, why it's so imperative that we have this conversation. Thank you so much, Tori. Hello, everyone. My name is Tioni Luckett. My pronouns are she, her, and hers. Um, professionally, I work at Transgender Law Center. I am a senior national organizer and I manage the program Positively Trans. Um, Positively Trans is the premier and longest running uh, program at TLC um, when they decided to uh, change the focus from litigation to community, right, and being the voice for the community. And so um, I've been there for the last two years. Um, and the reason why I feel that it is important for this conversation to happen is because um, as it was said, I've been a fierce advocate um, since 2014 when I stepped on the scene, right? And the very first thing that I did publicly was at Pacha. Um, and now here I am sitting on the planning body itself um, nine years later, and I will, that is forever um, going to be a part of my story. Y'all are going to get tired of hearing it because it is so significant um, that the very first time that I chose to share my story, there were people in a room who heard me um, and who valued what I had to say and felt like what I had to say had been missing from the overall conversation, right? And so my job here today is to give that back 
to that same planning body that saw something in me, right? Because what I've noticed is that trans men have been missing from a lot of the national conversation. Okay, well, this is where I can use my transness to my advantage because I got my brothers right here with me, right? And I've always said that I don't want my advocacy to be about me, but to be about those who come after me. And I don't want them to have to experience the things that I've had to experience, right? Not being trans is not a monolith. All of us are not going to face adversity the same way. And I know that all of our voices are needed. So thank you, Tori. Thank you, Tiomi. And since we've been talking about the guys, I think now would be a great time to have each of them join us. Um, we have three beautiful and brilliant Black men who are going to join us. They're going to tell you a little bit about who, them, who they are. And then we're going to get right to the questions. As they are coming, you're going to hear a lot about Blackness and whiteness and Blackness and non-whiteness. Um, and if you're sick of hearing white people, if you all are sick of hearing about Blackness and race, uh, uh, racism, we're sick of having to talk about racism, having to experience it. Let me make that abundantly clear. But it's still a conversation that needs to be had. So um, please welcome uh, AJ Scruggs, D. Jamel Young, and Jamel Ware. I don't see them yet, but I know they are here. Awesome. Hey, AJ. There they are. Hello, gentlemen. Here. How are you today? <laughs> okay. It's okay. amazing. Great to be here. Good afternoon. Thank you guys Wonderful. so much for being here. Thank you. So we introduced you all in alphabetical order. So perhaps it would be a great way for you all to introduce yourselves. So AJ, D, Jamel, and then Jamel. And then we're going to get to the questions. All right. Thank you so much, Tori. Um, first of all, my name is AJ Scruggs. My pronouns are he, uh, they, and King. Use them all or just use my name. Um, I am the executive director and founder of Visible Truth 365 based in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, where we connect Black trans folks to growth opportunities, whether spiritual, professional, or uh, personal. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I'm a man of many hats, um, as well as I'm currently serving my second year as the Take Civic Engagement Fellow here in Pennsylvania, where we are moving legislation to protect trans kids in schools. Um, I am also a facilitator and coach with the NMAC Elevate program, um, a program that has changed my life uh, and my work. Um, and also, I am a proud member of Positively Trans and Positively Trans Masculine. Great. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, great to be here and to share my experience and my uh, lens. My name is DJ Mel Young. I'm a 36-year-old man of trans experience. Uh, military veteran, hybrid from Brooklyn and also here in Atlanta currently. I am a community leader and advocate, founder and executive director of TMSM Connect, which centers trans masculine and non-binary folks assigned female at birth, who identify as gay, uh, bisexual, pansexual, and queer, um, and centering sexual health education and HIV prevention support. Also the recruiter and, edu and community educator for Emory University's uh, School of Medicine Clinical Research Site in which we enroll folks into sexual health studies uh, predominantly around HIV prevention. Like AJ said, I'm a man of many hats as well, part of many different committees and councils, also a trainer for the MMAC Elevate. And again, I'm just excited. I, I've, I'm, I am elated and driven by all the other presentations ahead and I'm just ready to jump into it. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Jamel Ashley Ware. I'm an entertainer, educator, and entrepreneur who runs a, a micro grants program for aspiring entrepreneurs age 18 to 29. Um, I help them build their dreams and bring them to life. I've been doing that for the past four years. I also am an MBA candidate at Emory, Boys at a Business School. I am here as an advocate um, who is trans masculine, who is also a birthing parent, who is a partner, uh, and someone who believes and dreams and that all people should have a right for their dreams to be brought to life and have a right to right liberty, um, to life, liberty, and love. 
Awesome. Thank you. And welcome, Jensen. We're going to get to the conversation and a very quick shout out to uh, Positively Trans. Um, the first trans person to ever serve on Pacha was Cecilia Chung, who's one of the co-founders of the Transgender Law Center. And you have uh, Siomi, who serves as the senior policy organizer and, and two board members here. So shout out to that. See, trans people, we know what we're talking about and we know what we're doing. That's we right. just need space and opportunities to lead. So Tiomi, can you start off, off start us off with some questions for the gentleman, uh, for our panelists, please? Sure, sure. Uh, okay, and like I said, um, or I probably hadn't gotten around to it because I'm so excited for this panel to happen and I'm so glad that it is happening. Um, and a little bit like how I got here is because I came in at a time when um, a trans voice was needed, it was wanted, it was welcomed, right? And so I just happened to be in this space. And so, um, but I, and when I came into this space, there were a lot of misconceptions about what it meant to be a trans woman. And a lot of focus was on trans women. So um, I had to explain to people that there is no one way to be trans, right? So what do you want to say? And what does it mean to be a black trans man for you? I guess I could start it off. Um, Tiomi, I heard you mention earlier that we are not monolithic. And so I want to be very clear that there is no one way to be trans or even a trans man. Um, and that I like to, a lot of times, preference what my uh, understanding or perspective of what a trans, trans, being trans is. And if you simply identify differently than what you were assigned at birth, that is what makes you trans. How you transition in that journey, did you take along with it? It's its own conversation, and that's when it becomes more personable. For me to be a Black trans man, it means just that. I'm Black. I'm a man that happens to be of trans experience. But with that, that means I'm a son, a brother, um, a friend, a lover, your colleague, your next-door neighbor, the gentleman who held the door for you. Um, I'm, I'm a man. I'm a Black man who wants to enjoy life, who wants to be financially free, who wants to have healthy sex and love, want to be loved and accepted. But it also means that I'm also fighting for my safety as a Black man. Um, it means that I, a lot of times, have barriers that are in the way of my happiness. And it means I have less equitable opportunities. Um, and at the end of the day, it means I'm a human being. I really appreciate that. Thank you, Dijamil. Um, AJ or Jamil, you want to jump in? I'll jump in. Um, for me, my trans identity is me honoring my spirit it is me bringing my the spirit that i was put on this earth with and presenting it to the world my blackness is just what dj Mel said it means first of all i'm black first i can't hide that it means that i have to work harder to to bring my dreams to life um it means that representation for me is essential so it means that i have to be visible i don't get a choice to just go about my life so as a black trans man who is also queer it means that uh, my identities are they continue to intersect uh, my sex it means that i have to be someone who talks about the difference between gender identity and sexuality. It means that I have to fight for reproductive um, rights because I am a trans man who decided to give birth. Um, it means that when I do, as DJ Mel said, that my safety as a Black man is also a number one priority. And then it also means that my safety as a trans man elevates um, the desire uh, or the need uh, to <laughs> to take care of myself. So being a black trans man for me is a uh, um it's an inner all these intersecting identities that require me to be hyper aware of myself and my surroundings at all times. Thank you, Jamil, and I agree. The first thing that people see is that we're black. We may have to tell them that we're trans, but the first thing that they see is that we're Black, and that has its own implications in how we navigate through life. So thank you for sharing that. AJ? To absolutely echo what both brothers have actually brought to the forefront, um, 
my blackness kind of drives my manhood. So I, I know that it means that I have to be responsible and that means being responsible for one myself and then those around me. Um, there's a level of protection that I am required to provide um, to my community, but I, I kind of pride myself on being a man for my community. Um, so what that means, that also means that I am also teachable, um, that I'm also held accountable for things that I may pr project um, like toxic, toxic masculinity. Um, like for some of us, it's been a journey to detoxify that masculinity and even internally. So, um, even how we deal with engaging with partners, whether we decide to be open or whether we live more DL, which we can actually dig a little bit more into a little bit later, but it is also to be a leader and also, uh, Just be responsible. That that has been my number one thing with being a black man, being a responsible black man. Um, my transness comes second because it's something that I take care of in the medical office. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And God, it was just like so powerful again, um, just to hear that like my transness is me presenting my spirit to the world, right? That's my gift to y'all. Something I already knew, but you didn't know. So I really appreciate that. Tori. Yeah, so I knew this would be incredibly powerful. So the opposition, at first I wrote down uh, for this question, the conservatives, but the truth is some of us as well as somewhat conservative ideas around certain aspects of our lives. Um, so the opposition, they have a very organized uh, and impactful attack on SOGI and DEI initiatives. Please tell us why these are important in education, in workforce, in community, and in particular when it comes to the fight against HIV. I think I can kick this one off. Um, so with the work that I've been doing with uh, civic engagement and legislative policy here in the state of Pennsylvania, we've noticed that there has been an attack on schools and LGBTQIA uh, students who are just trying to go to school and get education. Um, all they wanna do is be themselves, express themselves and not be uh, tortured for it. Um, like there are, the panelists can kind of attest to what their lives was like going through school as themselves, just trying to be themselves and how difficult that is coupled on top of like regular teenage problems. So, um, it's important for adults to kind of take those stands because we do have the voting rights to do so and actually protect our children and protect those youth that are in educational spaces um, just trying to get an education. And um, I can kind of like tie in with the workforce if it wasn't for somebody speaking up and changing um, the fact that gender identity was not protected at my job and that person happened to be me because I saw the <laughs> worker's manual and say orientation's protected but gender identity is not so I can bring my very queer uh trans masculine behind to work but they can fire me because I'm trans because it's not a protected class so it's important to have those non-loopholes to to be able to protect all the folks that are in the workforce and in community period and I just I want to kind of piggyback off of some things that AJ said. You know, I'm an entrepreneur first and foremost. And when I think about entrepreneur, entrepreneurism, it's it's not just about starting a business. Entrepreneurialism works well in the workforce too, because what it's about is innovation. But if we're talking about an attack on the trans identity, then when I go to work, how in the, and I don't feel safe. How am I going to give you my best self? So when I think about this from a business standpoint, because that's just the way my mind works, is we cannot be assured that we have the the best outcomes at our businesses. We cannot be assured that we have safe work environments. We cannot be assured that. Um, we're just going to have innovation or creativity inside of the workspace if people cannot show up 100% confident that they are in a space that is going to nurture all of them. Because what happens when we have the, 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 our, the conservatives attacking us and making all these laws left and right is that we then go into the world with shields up. We go into the world 
um, afraid of what might happen. And when one operates from a space of fear, we cannot and do not give our best selves or our best work to the world. I have to say, Jamel, you really hit that right on the head for me, um, and even my own personal experiences of navigating DEI. And, you know, oftentimes having to um, choose between being the colleague or the advocator and having to advocate for myself in the workspace in which I should not have to. That should not be a space in which my past is being bought up or axed of me. Um, and it's an uncomfortable situation, like you said, Jamel. Like, it was very uncomfortable for me to go to work knowing that there was chatter around the office about me and my life and not knowing who said what, who feels what. Not only is that harmful to my mental health, but it's harmful to my physical safety. Because again, you're never knowing whose attitudes and biases and judgments go in which way. And once you're outside of a safe building, we still are trans. Um, off the clock, we are still trans. And so uh, you hit that right on the head for me, Jamal. Oh, oh, that's me. Okay. Thank y'all. <laughs> Thank y'all. Okay. So I'll go, uh, I'm going to pick it, send it right back to you, Dijamel, uh, because I know that, you know, you work um, at the college and y'all uh, like do a lot of work um, regarding like HIV. So um, how are men and folks of mas who are masculine of center uh, missed in accessing PrEP and treatment for HIV? Is that something that comes up in uh, your conversations at the school? So um, I work under the university. I don't necessarily work on campus. However, I work within community. And especially this is um, very impactful to the trans masculine community, um, which, you know, I feel like there's lots of resources for assigned male at birth as far, as far as accessing PrEP. And it might be because we're in the South. Um, but when it comes down to trans masculine individuals, it does become a barrier. Uh, one, there are still conversations that we're not at risk. Um, there are programs and policies in, in place that I'm sure that are based off of grant funding that are looking for specific demographics that we don't fit up under just because we're not assigned uh, male at birth. Also, too, like there are a lack of campaigns and materials that even reflect us that one that we're at risk and that there are prevention options for us. Then the other part is um, the lack of research. You know, there are prevention methods, but are they the best options for us? The best options are they being tested for us and with us in mind? So th those are some of the things that come up for me, especially around in research. Um, I'm a part of a couple of protocol teams in which I help inform and make sure that the language is affirming to trans. If you're going to invite trans masculine folks and the language needs to be affirming and in, in align with how they uh, center their lives. and and, and given considerations of if this uh, study is even impactful to the community. Um, and so, uh, yes, it starts, it also starts there with the research not really including us intentionally. So, yeah, I mean, it seems like a running theme from everything that we've heard, right? Because um, there were parts of, and I'm really thankful for like every conversation we've had up to this point. Uh, because I know that like in, by 2030, I'll be, I'll have been living with HIV by, for 20 years. Um, so I think I'll be considered a long-term survivor uh, at that point. Um, so I'm not quite there yet, right? Uh, but like when I did step into this arena, like I brought um, a unique perspective to the conversation. And so um, I thank you. And speaking of unique perspective, perspectives. AJ, you have been doing like a lot of like outreach and like just talking about um, the trans male experience. So um, in, in educating the masses, like where people don't usually go, which is social media. So does, has anything like this ever come up for you in your conversations? Absolutely. Um, one of the biggest things is that, um, as you can see in my background, guys like us, I kind of took um, I got I got a grant and actually did some traveling around the country and was able to talk to a couple of couple groups. So about 50 trans guys nationally. And what I have found, 98 percent of the guys that I have talked to know nothing about pep, prep or TASP. They know nothing about um, that. It's if it's for them, if it's even even there. So they haven't when I said something about um, injectable prep to them, they were like, wait. 
what? I can be taking two shots and you for guy for guys that take testosterone, we are most most of us are injecting our medication anyway. So another needle, okay, fine. We'll just add it to it. And it's a way for us to like not worry about it. But we can't even get there because there's so much lack of information. There are no, there's a big gap in research. No research is being done on what testosterone does over a period of time what does that look like if you're living with hiv what does like what happens as you age which is why like those are the gaps like we're there's no education there's no push for research there's a lack of funding because there is an erasure for afab body research so what i'm hearing you say is we want to be part of research but not guinea pigs Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I, that's what I heard. I, I think that's what you said. And that's what I heard. And for folks who are listening, and all of us that are, are part of this panel, we're aware of this. But I think there are folks who don't understand how sometimes, whether it's intentional or unintentional, when trans people are excluded from conversations or from research, how it certainly impacts more than just a person. It impacts communities, plural, of people. There are two uh, prevention modalities now that weren't, uh, that weren't, uh, that research didn't include people who were signed female at birth. Not only does that exclude people like Kay Hayes and, and Marlene McNeese, but also the gentlemen who are on our panel today. See how it affects multiple communities of folks? Um, and we often don't think of that because it may not apply to us directly. And I think that's important. All right. So with that being said, why does research and why also does the opposition focus so much on trans women and not on trans men? Go ahead, say it, AJ, because you look like you want to jump out of your seat. <laughs> Bursting at the seams. It's okay. That's why we're here. <laughs> okay. So there is this whole thing of like us being able to fly under the radar that is like this big myth with, within community. But the truth is what it is, is masculinity is not policed in the same way that femininity is. So we're able to access resources that our sisters may not, may not, um, we, which also can serve us to our detriment. Um, because being cis assumed is a gift and a curse. Um, one of the things is that like that big po policing bit, and I can give an example of like growing up as a little black girl, there was a way that I had to show up in society. Um, there was a way that I had to be, and it was usually to one, protect yourself from men. <laughs> um, and then kind of like um making sure that you appealed to men. So like there is a way that we can when we transition, some of that transitions with us. So like we don't necessarily get our voices until later on in life. Some of us kind of transition more toxically. Some of us um we just wanna be normal, just be one of the guys and like just have a regular life, which we all want a regular life, right? And what does regular look like for you? But when it comes down to being, I'm sorry, I wrote something. I wrote some things down and it's kind of like distracting me, y'all. Um, when it comes to trans masculinity, because we have the privilege of being cloaked by masculinity, there are, it's, it's a survival thing. Like we we don't we don't necessarily want to rock the boat if we've kind of achieved a certain level of safety and security. It is also um, a big issue that we don't want to be attacked as well because once we once we disclose that we are trans, we are now a target. And the reality is, our safety usually comes first. But again, a lot of us still are in that mindset of being seen and not heard from childhood. So we don't really use our voice as in the same ways that our sisters do. I can add briefly to that. Um, the opposition, I'm sure, targets uh, trans women maybe a little bit more um, just because even traditionally about gender norms and what expectations of expectations and um, yes, expectations of masculinity and femininity, what it's supposed to get. And I think that the expectation of masculinity is a lot more strict. 
Um, although I do agree with you, AG, uh, AG, AJ, that our masculinity is less policed, but we have more expectations um, about what and how we should show up into the world. So it's almost to this egotistic society, how dare a trans woman turn their back on, on being a man. Um, and so, you know, and sometimes I think that could even be a hit to uh, society or men's own projection of their insecurities. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think it's layered actually. And I think AJ, I really, uh, you, you did uh, hit a lot of points and I just pick, wanted to piggyback on that. I do think it's easier to sell the scary man in a dress theory though. Um, somebody brought that up to me and I was like, oh, it is. It's it's a lot easier. Of course it is. I'm five foot eleven and it's easy to tell a story and make me look like the meanie than it is for a guy who's five foot five. So you ain't had to bring height into this, not to worry. <laughs> <laughs> I had nothing to add. <laughs> no, no, I hear that. I hear that. It is uh, like different ways in which we are still in survival mode, right? Um, um, and so violence shows up like differently uh, for someone like me um, than it would for for one of you. Um, and so um, it's still, you hit it on the head of Dijamel, like how dare trans women turn away from being a man. And then on the flip side of that, um, how does this trans man um, think that he's a man, right? And so it becomes a thing of where your masculinity is tested, but in different ways, right? And so um, as a trans woman, um, when it comes to like who's attracted to me, they're attracted to me for my femininity, but um, they're a chance, there's still an opportunity for me to like try to or have to present male because I'm, I'm put in such dangerous situations simply for being who I am. And so thank y'all for sharing that. Um, and so um, going a little deeper into the conversation and touching on um, mental health. Um, because it is that plays on your mental health and having to navigate society in a certain way, um, being black one and people um, really wanting to vilify you simply because of the color of your skin and being male identified and adding that extra layer. So um, um, how going, like I said, going deeper into it, how has transitioning impacted your mental health and why is gender affirming care um, so important. And Jamel, specifically, if you could talk about um, being a birthing parent um, and what mental health care and reproductive care look like for you. Yeah, I actually um, just had this conversation last night. I, my undergrad degree is in social work. I got an undergrad degree. I'm going somewhere with this, so just bear with me. I got an undergrad degree in social work because it was simple. The only thing that I could see myself doing was graduating college. I didn't transition until after, after I graduated. And it wasn't until after I graduated that I could see myself as an older adult. And I could see myself with gray hair, that I could see myself living a, a life beyond my early 20s. My goal up until I graduated college was just that, to graduate. And once I transitioned, I realized that I had lived most of my life in a very depressive state. It was only because I had goals that allowed me to get from point A to point B. But once I transitioned, I was able to live, <coughs> excuse me, and to fully see myself. Now, the problem with this is that you start, you then start getting societal opinions, which then creates a whole different level of mental health problems because you've reached this pinnacle of being able to see yourself, of being able to walk through life as you are. And the world is continuously telling you that who you are is wrong. So there are layers of mental health that come with being a trans man. And then I decided with my partner a few years ago that we were gonna have a baby. 
And my partner and I were able to naturally have a child. I'll let you all figure out what that means on your own. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I was excited. We were excited to grow our family. But then a few questions pop up, right? Well, if you were going to have children and be with someone like your partner, why would you transition? <laughs> It's all these questions from people about why. And so here I am, as long as I'm in my safe space and in my bubble, do I feel sane, happy, loved, appreciated, valued? But when I have to deal with the world, I now feel depressed, anxious, unsure and have to spend hundreds of dollars on therapy a month just so that I can deal with society. <laughs> now, in the terms of reproductive health, you know, one thing that was never talked to me about, and I shouldn't say never because I do have a great OB, but was not talked to me about from a community standpoint was what postpartum would be like. And I think in hindsight, it's because people didn't know where to direct me because there are no... <laughs> mental health resources for a trans man who has given birth, who is dealing with postpartum. So I found myself back in my teenage years living in a depressive state alone because I didn't know where to go, who I could talk to, um, or <laughs> how to navigate in a system that only sees birthing as a right of women. This is where I get really passionate about the understanding between the difference between sex and gender. My sex are my reproductive organs, but my gender is who you see every day. And the only person you see is a black man. But because the world cannot separate gender and sex from one another, it leaves trans men who decide to give birth in a space of having to navigate postpartum alone. And what does that do to our families? What does that do to our children, to our partners, to ourselves? It becomes a very isolating experience. And if you're fortunate enough, you eventually will find someone who will help you navigate the situation. Like I was fortunate enough, but it was 10 months into dealing with this by myself and with my partner that I found a therapist who said to me, yes, I will help you navigate it. It wasn't because I wasn't looking, but I kept being met with, I don't think we're good. I'm a good fit for you. I don't think I can help you with that. Or just, just those looks that say, I don't understand you. And if your face and your body language says that, then I'm immediately walking out of the door. So how do we create systems and networks for trans masculine folks who desire to give birth or just even outside of giving birth who want to just navigate what it means to have been socialized as a little girl and to grown into a man and want to understand ourselves better in internally, who want to heal from childhood traumas, what space or network do we have? There are very few. And if and unless you are tapped into a network, being able to address our mental health is really a challenging thing to do without leaving a part of ourselves outside of the door. Thank you. Thank you. That's incredibly powerful. And I, I imagine it's also incredibly challenging. Um, and it's not just about finding a mental health therapist. It's finding one that is right for you which you articulated as well. So thank you for that. Thank you. Um, gentlemen, uh, D. Jamel and AJ, would you also chime in a little? Because we see really two extremes when it comes to reproductive care for trans men and gynecological care and overall health care for trans men. We see the Jerry Springer on one end, and then we see trans activism on the other. 
And the truth is, for most people, healthcare is somewhere in the middle. It's not folks who are on the front lines advocating in marches, and it's not folks that are on television. Surprise, guess what I have between my legs? For most people, our walk is somewhere along, somewhere in the middle of that or somewhere along uh, um, that extreme. So can you tell folks a little bit about, a little bit more about what reproductive and physical health care looks like for men like you? And uh, we heard about postpartum care. What about gynecological care? What about uh, reproductive justice? What about all kinds of other things related to your health care that perhaps folks aren't familiar with here? I want to answer that, but I also want to kind of uh, chime in on that last question about mental health. Um, one, one thing I think people underestimate is dysphoria, gender dysphoria and body dysphoria and what that does to the mental health. Before I even knew what that word meant, as I reflect on my childhood, I had lots of it. Um, you know, just even growing up, can you imagine not being able to face yourself in the mirror? You know, I can, I can remember as a kid brushing my teeth and really avoiding the mirror. And, you know, and I was fortunate enough to grow up being embraced as attractive, but what attractive meant to you did not reflect what I wanted to feel and present. And that made me shrink myself and made me want to isolate myself because I didn't want those triggers of what, of how you see me. Um, and so, you know, that's one thing, or even like by dysphoria, there's, there's times where I couldn't focus on a simple conversation because I'm like, are my chest too big? Am I I'm trying to fix my shirt? There's all these voices in your head that's, 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 that aren't affirming, um, and it, it reaffects your mental health. Um, second question was reproductive justice. Um, you know, I'm glad we are at a place where there at least are providers that are supportive of gender affirming care and are there to get us on hormones and are there to get us on the road to surgeries. But a lot of times, especially in my experience, those conversations in between about what our actual goals are, are not had, especially when it comes around family planning. Um, wasn't explained to me what hormones would do, you know, to my levels and my eggs and my fertility abilities. It wasn't explained to me what my options were. It wasn't given to me as an even affordable option. And so, you know, a lot of, a lot of guys have missed that mark to be able to, um, you know, carry their own child or even uh, give their eggs because they've already gone through a hysterectomy and were kind of misguided along their transition. Um, so, you know, things like that really impact once you get to your place where you're, you know, comfortable within yourself and, you know, I could walk amongst the world somewhat comfortable, now I'm ready to build a family. Where do, where, where do I go from here? Um, and that's actually one of my biggest things that I'm, that I'm struggling through and just trying to figure out what are my actual options. Um, I am the mouth in my region, so I don't play these types of games with my providers, period. Uh, um, and one of the issues that I had was my first referral to go see a GYN um, was to a woman's center. And um, I'm like, I'm going in there. You're sending my information over. They should have all the information necessary, but why do I have to go to a woman's center? So like I advocated to go somewhere else and it ended up being a more gender neutral name. Like it was named after someone. So like, it didn't really make me feel as dysphoric walking through the door. Um, and then also talking with my provider and he also hearing DJ Mel, like you weren't explained, didn't have those options explained to you. And I was like, I'm really fortunate to like the care that I was, I am currently receiving. Those are constant conversations. Anytime I go into my doctor to do my labs, any of that, um, has your, you know, has your plans changed? Do you want a family? Do you want to start a family? Like, do you, do, here are some of your options. Um, so again, like that needs to be across the board. That needs to be a mandated standard of care every time a trans masculine person goes into this, into their space so that they have those options to continue to, if it does change along the way, which it does. Like you couldn't have told me that 10 years ago, well, shoot, 14 years ago, when I was about to stick, get my first injection, 
that I would be trying to figure out what family planning looks like for me and having those actual family planning conversations with my doctor, even after being on testosterone over 10 years, which they tell you that it's almost impossible to have children after that point in time. I want to add, because that's interesting that you were told that, AJ, because no one ever said that to me. And we didn't start having, trying for our child until I had been on testosterone for almost 12 years. So, you know, same amount of time. So that I think that goes back to the research. There is no research. So there is no blanket answer. No one can actually really give you a straightforward answer about if family planning is even possible after you've been on testosterone for however amount of long time. I was told that, well, we don't know. We'll just wean you off and see how it goes. Wanted to add on to uh, what AJ said too. Um, not only is it uncomfortable for us to go to women, women's center, but imagine the scrutiny we get for sitting amongst women who are also there to get care as well. Um, imagine our safety being at risk because maybe they feel like their safety is at risk as well. Um, just wanted to point that part out. And then the other part is how many of us even make it to the gynecologist because of our own internalized barriers. Um, just as an assigned female at birth person, you know, and, and a lot of other people I've talked to because it's the men and women, uh, we weren't really talk about our bodies like that. We weren't really talk about, we didn't really talk about maintenance. When menstrual came along, it just came. I didn't really have those conversations. You don't have conversations about maintenance. And then, so then even add on the layer of not feeling affirmed in your body. Now you have to like face your demon at this doctor. Now you have to be face to face with my demon that I'm trying to avoid. So it's like, there's that mental health piece right there that a lot of guys need to be walked through to understand like, this is still your body. You still need to be in care, but you need to also have a, a good experience and be in a good mental space, you know, to be there. And I think that's overlooked. And that, that, that feeling extent, continues to extend if you decide to have a child as well, because I don't know how many of you know what the process of having a baby is like, but after a while you have to be in those doctor's office every three weeks and to be sitting in a waiting room with my partner and with a, well, luckily I've always had a pot belly. So it's really hard. It was hard to tell that I was pregnant, but still to be in that space every three weeks to be being looked at as if we were in the wrong space and then to have to be in a hospital to give birth which is already a taxing um activity in itself to say the least to have to do that with nurses and doctors and front staff folks and people who bring your food into the room and Everyone is looking at you like, why are you there? It does not create a safe space to bring a child into the world. No, that makes perfect, perfect sense. Um, so I'm hearing that more research is needed. Um, you guys are all needed at the table when it comes to the the planning, right? Um, and, and all the way up into implementation. Um, Jamel, you bring up such valid points. Um, I mean, because no one looks, no one bats an eye at same gender loving couples as they're pushing a stroller down the street, right? Like nobody bats an eye now. Um, uh, but when you are in that experience and in the hospital um, and going to doctor's visits and um, AJ, you know, um, one time I heard you talk and you were talking about being in, the gynecologist's office and, you know, regulating your health, something that you have to do um, and the looks that were given to you because people felt like you did not belong there. And it was even more amplified for you, Jamel. Um, so again, I wanna thank y'all for sharing those experiences um, with the broader um, Pacha here um, and, and the colleagues that I have here today because um, I learned from y'all just in those settings and so y'all needed to be here. And uh, 
shameless plug like if y'all want to stay here they're accepting applications until january 5th okay i said it but the ending the hiv epidemic um recommends that uh, transgender folks play a bigger part in the hiv care continuum in order to end the hiv epidemic um, and so um, if you can, can you give us an example of how we can use meaningful involvement of people with HIV and AIDS um, and greater involvement of people with HIV and AIDS um, to more appropriately address HIV in the trans masculine community? I mean, I think that the most to me obvious solution would be to create um, trans inclusive HIV prevention programs. Um, that are including education, that are including community assessments to see what our actual needs are. Uh, let's see, I took some notes as well. Um, establishing a trans-led advisory board. Uh, let's see, training and capacity building, support and mentoring programs. Um, these are all these are all things that need to be happening together, not just one thing off the list, off the menu, these are all things as a collaborative effort um, that should be initiated. Thank you, Dijamil. Um, One of the things I've seen here in Philly is that when it comes to data collection, um, if it's lower than six, um, they don't collect it. And that completely erases trans men altogether when they're collecting transgender data. Um, so figuring out a way to make sure that we are getting folks in to collect that data, to make sure we're getting the numbers absolutely necessary so that our, we're, we're counted because we know that data equals money and funding and funding uh, provides resources. So um, that one of the other ways um, is pulling on those uh, on those leaders to form a coalition. I definitely agree with the coalition, some some form of like making sure that we are involved. Um, a lot of times we hear the word transgender community and we only see the girls. Um, we need to be very intentional about including the guys and our non-binary siblings as well, because we don't want them to be left behind. Nobody need to be, needs to be left behind because nothing about us without us is for us. Awesome. And can taking into account, I'm, we're also uh, looking at the com uh, the chat as well. Um, and several folks have mentioned non-binary individuals. Everyone here identifies as a man or woman who happens to be trans. There are also space and even some folks who are on the call today or who are on our Zoom uh, who identify as non-binary. And we certainly hold space and, and recognize that is an entirely different um, identity that also falls under the transgender umbrella. In order to have folks talk about non-binary experiences, we should have a panel with folks who identify as non-binary, subject matter experts in their own lives. But I also want to respectfully address one of the comments that Dr. Leo Moore typed about changing the names of women's centers. And I want everybody to hear this. And um, I think all of us as panelists, we agree on that. There are some times when it is totally appropriate to have specific spaces for cis people, for women, for men, et cetera. There also needs to be much more inclusion in all kinds of spaces for everyone. And there should be spaces that are trans only. I wanna make it clear that I don't think anyone thinks that there shouldn't be specific spaces for different communities. Trans people aren't saying that we should be everywhere. I, I, I know you didn't mean that, uh, Dr. Leo, so I meant that in a larger context, because that's what the opposition says. The opposition thinks that because we are, you guys are trans men, that you're trying to change the definition of man. No, you're not. Am I correct? You are correct. I'm glad you uplifted that because it is very much so about the inclusion of language and not the eraser of language. Yes, thank you for that. Thank you for that. Dr. Moore, you wanted to make a quick comment? Thank you. Yes, I just wanted to share that at least from, from where I was looking at this, there are often, at least in some spaces that I work in, specifically limited um, space for reproductive health. 
So my concern was if there's only one or two locations where all people can go, then if they're called women's center, then, you know, it prevents those, you know, who are trans masculine experience from feeling comfortable in those spaces. And as was mentioned, can uh, potentially make the uh, women in that space feel uncomfortable. So that's where my uh, comment uh, came from. Thank you. And thank you, because we appreciate that. I used to work at a place and the end of the name was such and such AIDS center. And I remember saying to the executive director, what if people don't have AIDS? Can they come to? You know, so names are very important. That's why we changed our names to more closely reflect who we are, but they also can be uh, very, very limiting as well. Um, great conversation. So um, we have about 15, no, about 10 minutes left in our conversation. Man, time flew by. So uh, gentlemen, we want to... Let's talk a little bit more about uh, the Indian HIV epidemic and how we're not in the habit. So we, we think of Pacha um, as yielding a lot of power and it would be great. I think we do without question, but we're also, most of the folks that I know who are part of Pacha, we're used to making a directive and something magical happens immediately afterwards. We're an advisory committee and we don't do direct services. And for some of us, that's been something that needs to, that we need adjustment on. So how about, and I heard this question asked to um, all of the other panelists, if you could sit down with Secretary Becerra, what would you ask or what would you advise or what would you say to Secretary Becerra? So kind of, I'm hearing Jamil's last couple of words in my head and um, asking secretary to um, help spread the, the, the understanding that we want to be included and not erase. That means language, that means presence. Um, I would like secretary to, to acknowledge our existence, um, acknowledge the barriers that are in place, acknowledge policies that affect us and that also language justice plays a part of that. Um, and that I would like to see more language around assigned female at birth versus women this and women that. Um, and to also, because one of the other things I've heard is the lack of data, um, support and fund research initiatives um, that center our experiences. Jamel, AJ, anything you'd like to add? This could be your big moment. I think that one thing that I would ask, particularly is for research around how HIV impacts um, the tra trans masculine community or particularly um, AFAB folks. Um, but I want to say actually trans mass folks, because I think that there is something very significant about people who have taken testosterone and how that plays um, into our lives. I also would like to ask for a mandated update on language, for language to be inclusive. And particularly in the area um, for me that is, is reproductive health. I think that it is necessary for the language to say women and birthing parents. That is my example of inclusion, but not exclu excluding people. We don't have to change the words that make, that have always been there. People know women, people know moms. That's great. And we will always have women and we will always have moms. And you also have birthing parents. That includes trans mass folks and it includes non-binary folks. So those would be my two ask. Do some research and let's truly look at what 
the language looks like. Um, I would have three um, to echo my brothers, it would be language. Language is important and words mean things. Um, to have inclusive language is not the erasure of other language. It is also, it's just adding to the dictionary. And we add words to the urban dictionary and the regular dictionary on a regular basis. We can do this policy-wise and in uh, the medical field, we can do this. Um, um, if not, well, education, making sure that we get our research and our data, fund those initiatives, because it's absolutely necessary to find out in this information because these are folks that are can be and possibly will be impacted by HIV in within their lifetime if we are going going by the current data for the transgender community that is inclusive of trans men whether the numbers actually reflect that or not because there are also folks who love transgender people who happen to be trans themselves which also makes them a possibility. In addition to not only do we need more research, but we need research that's conducted by our communities, just to be very specific. Thank you. Researchers can be trans. Uh, principal investigators can be trans. Evaluate Program evaluators can be trans. Uh, I could go on. Statisticians can be trans. Accountants can be trans. Janitors can be trans. Shall we continue? I think folks get it. All of there are a lot of us who can be trans and do a bunch of things other than work that includes the word trans in the title. So thank you all for that. All right. So uh Tiomi, uh, we're about to wrap up. So one more question for the guys. Well, does do I have to do it or can we invite other members of Pacha to ask that's questions a, as well. That's a great, so okay. that would be a great time to open the floor. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Tiomi, for, for getting me back on track. Thank you for that, because I get so excited, because these guys are always dropping knowledge. Um, I know, I the, the think it will become just a real conversation also. between us. So um, I'm going to invite everyone else to join in on this brilliance. But before we do, I'm going to make a disclaimer, um, Jamel. Will you please take care of yourself? Okay. Um, I am a real facilitator. I'm your real sister. Um, and so I need you here to be a part of this work. And if you need to excuse yourself because you're not feeling great, then please do that. Okay. Um, everybody say goodbye to Jamel. Um, and I love you. And I'll check on you after this call. Okay. All right. So uh, any questions that you have for Jamel, then. Um, um, we are all on a thread together. Send them to me and I'll make sure that Jamel gets them and get back to y'all, okay? But um, that's just how I roll. I really care about my people. Um, but now I will open the floor up to any member of Pacha that has a question for um, either myself or Tori or our panelists. Go I ahead, Daphina. Thank you so much. This was a marvelous discussion. So I want to thank you all. Tori and Tiomi, of course, but um, gentlemen, thank you for your leadership and your dedication in this work. I would love to hear more about your policy advocacy work and specifically how have you found it to be most effective in engaging community? Um, AJ, specifically, as you were talking about your focus and policy priorities, um, what does that look like? What has been a success for you? What is a best practice you would lift up as we talk about meaningfully engaging, meaningfully organizing, and providing opportunities for partic particularly um, you know, trans masculine folk, but just community at large. We would love to hear about your experience in mobilizing and activating folks to action and change. Thank you so much for that. Um, one of the things that I found is that it's a lot easier than folks um, know it to be. Um, a lot of times it's because of the language barrier um, that comes with dealing with politics and dealing with government. Um, and the easiest thing to do is reach out to your local representative um, in your district, 
um, and be begin to build a relationship with them and see it where your where your politics align. Um, what we were able to do were was to reach out to a group of legislators who um, who were active in the community, and then we actually stumbled upon. Um, a representative who was ready to champion um, a, a package, a bill package for us, um, who happens to be the father of a trans child. And then we were able to bring in other representatives who also were a part of the LGBTQ caucus and also parents of trans children. Um, so connect the heartstrings, truthfully. Um, folks that really care about this issue exist, especially in um, within government and that have been fighting along alongside us for a very long time. So you have to be able to make those connections. And if you start from your city level and working your way up, um, it it never fails, truthfully. Just trust the process. Oh, and to answer what the what was one of the biggest wins, we were able to present uh, a four bill package this Tuesday, this past Tuesday, uh, for non-discrimination, non-disclosure, uh, bathrooms and locker rooms, as well as inclusive LGBTQ um, curriculum. Thank you. Alicia, and then Vincent. Thank you. So I, um, First of all, I really just from my heart want to say thank you, thank you, and thank you, um, because it's very educational. We need to hear it. I'm so glad that this space has been made possible for you all. And a question that I did have, someone actually mentioned it in the chat already, <laughs> and it was really, but I'm adding another word, how can accomplices and allies, because my understanding there's a difference for your community with allies and accomplices, better support your work? Of course, you want to connect with uh, trans masculine leaders. Um, there are several of us who are managing our own nonprofits. Um, so supporting whatever efforts we have going on. Um, but you know, for me, I feel like one of the smallest but biggest things that an ally can do is hold those uncomfortable conversations when we're not around. You know, taking all the things that we've learned here, you know, it's great that you can receive it and it's, you know, good information, but share that information with someone who's not on that same page and changing perspective one by one will go a long way. I agree. Thank you so much for that. Oh, <laughs> go ahead, AJ. <laughs> no, I, I literally came off to say I agree. Yeah, definitely. Um, and so I see Leo. Um, I think we have two minutes. So uh, okay. Leo, go ahead. <laughs> Thanks, Tiomi. So first, I thank you guys so much. I wrote down so many, so many things that I want to reflect on, actually. Um, but one question that I had for um, for you, DJ Mel, just based on um, what was just shared, um, because as I've been thinking about this around HIV stigma specifically, um, in spaces where people say negative things about people living with HIV, similarly in spaces where people may say negative things about trans trans persons, we have to be able to, you know, quickly provide a counterpoint. So I'm just wondering where people, you know, can learn more about people of, of um, trans masculine experience, you know, things of that nature, so that we can just ensure that we're educating folks and sending them to the appropriate spaces. Sure thing. So I can share my personal website. And AJ, I'm, I'm pretty sure you have some things to share as well. Um, my site would be TMSM Connect, which want to be clear about that acronym. Uh, MSM is used heavily in the provider um, CBO environment, which means men who have sex with men. So TMSM simply means trans men who have sex with men. Um, so my website is tmsmconnect.org. AJ, would you like to share yours? Absolutely. Um, so I am Mr. Social Media, so I make it easier for folks to follow on their various social media so I can be found at the Lavender Bandit, um, where I do a lot of educational uh, TikToks, uh, videos, I share um, other opportunities for folks to connect with community. 
um, via my social media. I kind of use my social media as the portal uh, until later notice. Um, I was told that um, a, works, a website is being worked on, but I don't know where I heard that at. But. <laughs> uh, well, also like to say, like, that is one of the challenges we have is that there is really no one hub of information. Um, and so we've been working on that. We've been working on resource books and referral processes. And so, you know, that's some feedback to take back. That It's a real need to have a one-stop shop place to really get all the information and resources about our community. Yes, because so much stigma is rooted in misinformation. You know, mm-hmm. how do we ensure that people, you know, truly are educated on your community? Thank you. All right. Well, um, we are one minute past the time, according to the agenda, Um, but I'm going to ask this anyway. Um, Do we have four minutes or no minutes? (laughs) It's okay. It's okay. Y'all can tell me that I'm being extra. It's okay. Okay. So uh, Mackenzie, I'm so sorry. We're going to have to close out and then um, go into a break, but I do want to thank AJ Dijamel and Jamel, thank you. Please take care of yourself. I mean that. Um, thank y'all for providing your expertise and your willingness to speak in this platform of all platforms. So uh, go big or go home, right? And so uh, thank you again. And I'm going to turn it back over to um, who was doing this? All right. Marlene. Marlene, gonna... that, there you go. Marlene, there you go. In Marlene's hands because she's always taking. So I appreciate you, Tori, and you, Tiomi. Thank you so much for your brilliant expert facilitation. You did not disappoint and brought us all kinds of new information. So uh, as you can hear, a lot of eagerness around folks wanting more. Uh, So thank you to uh, Dejamel and to AJ. And uh, I know our our friend Jamel probably wasn't feeling up to snuff, but did it anyway. Uh, So I certainly wanted to express my appreciation to uh, your input here today. And hopefully we'll see more of you. Uh, There should be an intention around seeing more of you. I appreciate that. Um, According to your agenda, we are scheduled to take a break, uh, but we are taking um, co-chair's privilege. And I think we're going to roll right into uh, public comments. I'm going to pivot to uh, Vincent uh, for him uh, to take over at this point. And then I think that may allow us for a nice little bit of extended break before we uh, transition over to Pacha to the people, uh, if that works well for everyone. So Vincent, I turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Marlene. So uh, the panels have been absolutely fantastic. I've been really struck by uh, much of the learning and the new ideas that I think uh, have been percolating. So I look forward to us having time later to discuss further. Uh, Before we move on, I just want to go back for a second uh, to the panel on aging. I want to just recognize that Jeff Taylor asked a question regarding the HOPE Act. And at the time, we didn't respond uh, because we didn't know the answer. And I didn't want anyone to feel like we weren't responding to the question. And so, Jeff, terrific question. All questions are really welcome and valued, and we will follow up. And so just wanted to publicly share that uh, you know, with everyone. So with that, uh, I'm going to transition to the next part of our agenda, which is really dedicated to public comment. As a reminder, uh, pre-registration was required to provide a comment here today. If you did not pre-register but would like to submit a comment, please email your written statement to pacha at hhs.gov by close of business day on Wednesday, December 13th. And uh, I'm going to turn this over now to Kay, who will administer public comment. Thank you, Kay. Great. Thank you so much. And just powerful presentations. And uh, I could keep listening. Uh, So sorry we had to cut and go to the next agenda item. I did want to pivot and say we actually do know the answer when you talk about the HOPE Act and what is going on from the Pacha member, Jeff. Uh, A lot of it, that work is done by HRSA. Uh, in their blood lane, as well as uh, in our office, the Office of Infectious Disease and HIV AIDS Policy with my blood and tissue safety and availability game uh, team, I should say. Uh, so they're looking at uh, the, the rule on that because, of course, in the space of HIV and aging and what's happening with the HOPE Act, 
uh, available. Um, uh, uh, transplants is key uh, when you're talking about people living long with HIV. So there is more to come on that. Uh, we can certainly do a briefing for POTCHA members uh, to, to go sort of deeper in, in the weeds in that. But I did want to quickly reflect on that and make sure that we addressed uh, Jeff's question. I popped on, but then they were still talking. So I popped back off because I wanted to honor the space that was going on. So with that, we will open public comment. We have two public com commenters and we receive written comments from three people. Our POTCHA members have those written comments already. So I want to acknowledge that. So our first public comment is from Terry Wilder. And I saw Terry's name on the platform. So Terry uh, is with HIV Aging Policy Advocate for SAGE. Terry, the floor is yours. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so like was mentioned, I'm Terry Wilder. I'm the HIV Aging Policy Advocate at SAGE. Um, we're the country's largest and oldest organization dedicated to improving the lives of LGBTQ plus older people and older people living with HIV. We were founded in 1978 and we're headquartered in New York City. For the past few months, I've really spent a lot of time interacting with folks in the world of HIV and aging research. So really appreciate um, the question that was raised earlier and the conversation around research. Um, I've been speaking with researchers who do research in HIV and aging and research activists nationwide. And what emerged were some real critical challenges impacting this field. So first, navigating the labyrinth of research application submissions poses a significant hurdle. So what I was told is if you're not affiliated with the AIDS clinical trial group site, kickstarting the funding process becomes an intimidating feat and pushing a proposal through ACDG even more daunting. The NIH's division of institutes are based on specific body organs, and that creates confusion regarding which institute aligns with the researcher's HIV and aging proposal. So where should these funding requests even be directed? The resounding plea from these HIV and aging researchers uh, really expressed a, a dire need for a centralized system for applying for HIV and aging grants. Streamlining this process isn't just a luxury, it's a necessity. If scientists face insurmountable barriers in accessing funding, how can we expect any groundbreaking discoveries? So now let's factor in the ever looming specter of potential NIH budget cuts. So how can we underscore the urgency for a clear centralized application mechanism for HIV and aging research funding? Now this isn't solely about financial resources. It's about empowering researchers to navigate the system effectively and efficiently. And so here's the crux. We must advocate for a transparent, accessible, and supportive system for our researchers. Without this critical infrastructure, the potential for significant advancements in HIV and aging research remains stifled. So as mentioned earlier today, if we consider that 50% of all people living with HIV in the United States are 50 and older, and by 2030, that percentage will skyrocket to 70% in less than seven, year, seven years, we must recognize that the clock is ticking. So stories abound of researchers waiting years for the entire application process to conclude. Time really isn't on our side and we need answers to HIV and aging research questions now. We can't afford to let bureaucracy be the barrier preventing these dedicated researchers from diving into this work or demoralizing them before they even start drafting their applications. There's a growing community of researchers eager to delve into HIV and aging, and it's our duty to facilitate their efforts. We also owe it to those living with HIV, especially the aging population, long-term survivors and lifetime survivors, to accelerate the pace of discovery in this field. We really must recommend that a centralized system be put in place immediately at the NIH for HIV and aging grants. Thank you for your time.
Thank you so much, Terry, for your comment. Our next public comment is from Vanessa Johnson. Vanessa, on the platform. The floor is yours, Vanessa. Thank you, Kay. Yes. And I thank you. I want to send thank you to the Presidential Advisory Council of HIV and AIDS for the opportunity to share this comment with you. My name is Vanessa Johnson. I am a co-executive director for Ribbon located in Largo, Maryland. I'm here on behalf of the EPIC movement, a transformative change movement led by Black cisgender women living with HIV. And today I wanted to address the efforts to end the epidemic in this country and older adults living with HIV. Today, the disease we are talking about is HIV. However, as many concerned individuals and entities have noted, we must fight the disease that is destroying individuals, communities, and societies across the globe. Even the United States, with its economic might, is no longer immune from this destruction because we are out of balance with ourselves, the environment, and the universe. Our nation is undergoing an unprecedented upheaval of civil and human rights. We long-term survivors over 50 years old and our younger lifetimers bear witness to what a combination of community, government, academic institutions, service organizations, and private entities did to stop a surge of death sweeping across the nation and the globe that started 40 years ago. Yet there is so much more to do. Only by pursuing wellness for individuals, families, communities, and institutions in true partnership with the spectrum of communities across this nation can we reverse the harm done and protect our future. So how do we do this in the HIV movement? We must continue to uplift and empower women with HIV by promoting and supporting their leadership in this movement. We are the Harriet Tubmans who lead people to freedom from internalized HIV stigma. We are the Sojourner Truths who speak the truth about the injustices that we face as women. We are the Billy, Billy Averys fighting for holistic health, inclusive of he sexual health and reproductive rights. The Audre Lords who advocate that we do not live single issues and the Kimberly Crenshaws who live intersectional lives. We compel individuals and entities with decision-making authority and resources to work in meaningful partnerships with networks of people living with HIV to take the following three actions. The first, invest in establishing a kitchen cabinet of women leaders at the federal level. It is a fact that women often initiate movement building from their kitchen which makes sense because we feed ourselves, our loved ones, friends, neighbors, and coworkers. The food we give is not just a source of nutrition, but also a way to show compassion, empathy, and encouragement that sustains many. Many women warriors and leaders over the age of 50 have grown with the evolution of the HIV movement and continue to represent vast segments of the Black community and Black women. Their work, our work improves the quality of our lives and those we come in contact with. Second, give the communities the money. It is important to acknowledge the progress that research and medical efforts have made in increasing the longevity of life for people living with HIV. However, these efforts alone will not end the HIV epidemic. Investing in networks of people living with HIV can strengthen engagement and civic participation allowing for a more comprehensive approach to addressing various critical issues, including the obtainment of social justice. And Vanessa, I, I know you are close to coming to the end, but I know you've gone past the three minutes. I just want oh, to- Oh, they told me I had five minutes. Oh, they told you I had five? Oh, yes, ma'am, they oh, did. they did. Oh my, okay, well, mm -hmm. you're at three, I think I heard, so I will honor that, please. Okay, okay I'll be done in 30 seconds. Okay. The third action is this national summit must focus on the four priority populations most impacted by HIV. Without building off the work of the national, without building off the work of the national HIV AIDS strategy, it's difficult to see how we can end this epidemic. We must also truly understand the data or the lack thereof data 
to better understand what is happening within these groups, especially black women. We need to be better. We need to do better to make progress towards ending this epidemic. Thank you. Thank you so thank much. You. That was perfect. <laughs> well, thank you for the public comments. Thank you for those that wrote uh, uh, and uh, sent our sent in their written comments. We have those. And please, if you have uh, uh, additional information, please reach out to Pacha at all times. With that, I'm going to turn it back over to our Pacha co-chairs, Marlene McNeese and Vincent Kiamo Ramos. Thank you so much, Kay. So I think we're going to go on break until 4.30, where we start our next segment, which is Pacha to the People. Just want to say thank you to Vanessa and Terry. Those comments were excellent. And we've got about, uh, about nine minutes. And so please use the link that is available on the HHS uh, site, and we'll see you at 4.30. Thank you. Produced by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services.